I'm Lisa. I'm the program director for LACNETS. Welcome to everyone who's here today, um, both here in the room, it's a packed room, and joining us um, via live stream. So what I've asked these ex this excellent team to speak on today is share shared decision making with your net experts. Because as you know, decision making is a big part of this journey, right? From the very beginning, there's a ton of decisions like who do I talk to? What do I need to know? How do I find a net expert? So that's one of the first things we push, right? Finding a net expert. How do you find one? Well, there's ways. We have certain resources like um, Carcinoid Cancer Foundation has um, a list of, uh, and so does NetRF. Uh, other, there's ways in talking to people. You're asking, who are the people you see? Well, once you find a net expert, what do you do with that decision? <laughs> um, and also going to the net expert, sometimes we expect them to tell us exactly what to do, but it's not always that simple. Um, it's not always very straightforward. Or what if there's differing opinions? What do you do about that? That's the common questions we get. So I've asked um, these experts to speak on that and how they go about um, handling this, you know, uh, this pathway with us together. And I have seen them do it in this shared decision-making way, which um, I think is really beautifully done. And I think um, in the long run, even if um, it may be a little harder in the beginning to um, grow to our own and find our voice. I think it's something that's helpful to find our voice and work with our physicians together to find the best way to make decisions for us. So Dr. Ganji um, will be our first speaker and she is um, a surgeon here at Cedars. Welcome, Dr. Thank you. Um, so thank you guys all for being here. We're, we're certainly happy to have you and thank you for LACNETS for giving us this opportunity to talk to you today. Um, so this is a new talk for me. We're talking about shared decision making for patients. Um, so we'll kind of go through, through some things um, generally about when you're diagnosed with a neuroendocrine tumor, what happens, and then maybe how to choose your surgeon or what surgery even means if that's something that, that is um, in your treatment. So I have a neuroendocrine tumor. Now what? Well, so <laughs> I was trying to make this presentation. And, and as you know, nets are represented by zebras. And you might wonder, why, what does a zebra have to do with a neuroendocrine tumor? Well, as medical students, when we go through training, they tell us something. They say, when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. And that's meant, don't think about things that are rare. If it sounds like a horse, it's probably a horse. It's not going to be something that's coming out of left field, like a zebra. Well, neuroendocrine tumors, they're pretty rare diseases. And so that's one of the reasons they're represented by zebras. And the second reason is because no two zebras have the same stripes. Now, I haven't personally gone out and looked at multiple zebras to tell you that this is true or not, um, but that's the speculation. Um, and so when it comes down to a neuroendocrine tumor, um, I think it's well represented by this poem by Shel Silverstein, and I'll read it to you in case you can't see. But it says, I asked the zebra, are you black with white stripes or white with black stripes? And the zebra asked me, are you good with bad habits or bad with good habits? Are you noisy with quiet time or quiet with noisy times? Are you happy with some sad days or sad with some happy days? Are you neat with some sloppy ways or are you sloppy with some neat ways? And on and on and on and on and on he went. I'll never ask a zebra about his stripes again. Um, and that's kind of representative of how these neuroendocrine tumors may behave, right? We're constantly asking questions. Why did it go here? Why did it go there? Why is it behaving this way? Why is the metastasis like the... So, we don't know, but this is a good representation of why that happens. And potentially, this is part of the reason that sometimes it's so difficult to get to a diagnosis. It's possible that many of you in this room were diagnosed with other conditions before di being diagnosed with a neuroendocrine tumor. Among those, you may have been told that you have irritable bowel syndrome or gastritis or anxiety or inflammatory bowel disease, asthma, menopause for the women in the room. Um, and this, this uh, fact was actually recently put out by, on World Net Cancer Awareness Day that one in two U.S. patients were diagnosed with other conditions when they had a neuroendocrine cancer. Um, and so sometimes it takes a little while before you get to the date that someone actually tells you, hey, we know what this is, this is a neuroendocrine tumor. Um, and this, you know, you're never necessarily prepared for it, um, and it's something that you have to deal with. Now, 
after the diagnosis, people have varying emotional responses, right? You might have the, the typical negative response where you go through shock, anxiety, loneliness, sadness, you eventually kind of filter in this transition phase um, and you either then kind of move to restoration and acceptance or you can, you know, just never really accept the, the fact that you've been diagnosed with some kind of a cancer and that's why it's important to know your support group. Now there's other people who accept it and they're able to be positive throughout the entire process. And this obviously is a new normal, right? It changes how you may interact with your family and friends. It may change what you do at work, how you interact with the people at work, um, how you define your social support. Some people dive in and they're open to talking to everyone about it and want everyone to know what they're going through. Others say, I've had many patients who say, you know what, I don't really talk to my closest friends anymore because when I talk to them, they make me feel like I'm sick. They're constantly asking if I'm okay. If I cough or if I sneeze, then it's automatically What's wrong? Did something happen? What did the doctor say? And so I feel better when I'm not engaged. Um, and so you may choose to withdraw, not because you're not feeling well, but because other people make you feel as though you're ill. So it's important to kind of understand um, what your new normal is. Um, you become stressed about being stressed. You're told don't stress. And then you find that you're stressing about a decision. And then all of a sudden you're stressed that you're stressed. And then you're even more, and then everyone's stressed and you don't even know what to do with that. Um, and then you have all these decisions to make, right? Here's a tumor that they tell us is rare. It's represented by a zebra. Nobody knows what's happening next. How am I supposed to know what's happening next? What does it mean? What kind of treatment do I need and what kind? Um, and I think the bottom line is, you know, patients are typically accepting of the fact that this is a new normal, but everyone wants a good new normal, right? Um, and so it's important to define that with the people that are closest to you. Now that comes down to, to something that I find really important when speaking to my patients, and that's shared decision making. So what, what is shared decision making? Well, it's a process in which clinicians and patients work together to make decisions, select tests, treatments, and care plans based on clinical evidence that balances risks and expected outcomes with patient preferences and values. So historically, and even maybe now, there's a traditional kind of unidirectional view. You go to your doctor, they tell you, this is what you have, this is what we're going to do, this is the best way to do it, and that's it, right? You're allowed to ask questions, but it doesn't really matter um, <laughs> what, your, <laughs> what your opinion or viewpoint is. Um, but the way to kind of go about it is this really new bi-directional patient-centered view, where our job as the physician is to educate you, um, and that's what I tell my patients. When you come in, I say, you know what, there's a, probably a hundred different ways that we can approach this, and although I say a hundred, I probably really mean five. Um, <laughs> But my job is to tell you what all the different options are and to listen to you tell me, hey, this is what I'm willing to go through and this is what I'm not willing to go through. And what does each treatment mean for me? It allows for empowerment of the patient um, and it allows for partnership. Um, and the endpoints are then better, right? Because they're centered around the patient and not necessarily a one size fits all kind of approach, which is especially important in neuroendocrine tumors. Now, there's been plenty of research that has been done that says when you kind of use this shared decision-making approach, patients are three to five times more satisfied with their providers. Um, so when we're able to listen to you, elicit your goals and concerns, and explain the options, that allows for increased satisfaction on your part, better adherence to treatment plans, likely because you're understanding why we're doing them. Um, there's greater treatment engagement. You're an active participant in your own treatment. <coughs> and better quality decision making. So here at Cedars-Sinai, we, we have a, a great neuroendocrine group. Um, three of us are here today talking to you, but there's about a dozen or more people that aren't. Um, and it's a, it's a great team um, and a really fun team to work with. But we believe that our patients should be fully informed, meaning you should have access to accurate, unbiased, understandable information, something that you should be able to take home and digest and share with friends, family, um, or whomever else you're talking to. You should feel supported and encouraged to participate in your healthcare decisions. Um, and you should be respected by having your goals and concerns honored, right? So although we feel that one treatment might be the best for you, maybe that surgery, maybe you absolutely don't want, no way, you don't want surgery. And that's acceptable. And that's something that we're willing to honor and respect. So what are my responsibilities as a physician when a patient comes to see me? Well, I find that one of the most important things is that I could provide easily understandable information regarding your diagnosis. Provide you with a list of options. 
provide the pros and cons for each of those options and how they relate specifically to you. And then most importantly, listen. You might be coming in with an issue that I'm not even going to address if I don't listen to what you have to say to me, right? Um, so you want someone who's listening to you. That's supposed to be a cartoon image of me explaining something. And I think <laughs> the patient doesn't like the new Cedar sinai logo is what I decided when I put it in there. <laughs> what are your responsibilities as a patient? Well, your responsibilities are to inform your providers of your symptoms, your lifestyle, your goals, your treatment preferences, your past experiences. Maybe you were a caregiver. Maybe you saw someone go through X treatment that we're describing and that has somehow um, made that thought unattractive. Or maybe the word cancer elicits some kind of strong feeling because of a, a loved one that you knew at some point. Um, so it's important for us to understand what your past experiences have been. One thing I would urge you to do is be open-minded. Um, we're only suggesting treatments to you because we think they may be of benefit, even if they're ones that you don't choose. So be open-minded about hearing different options and different approaches. It's important. Um, and lastly, I can't, I can't overstate this, but you have to trust in your provider's knowledge and you have to feel empowered to add your own perspective. So if you're, if you're seeing someone who you really just don't feel like you can trust, there are plenty of excellent physicians out there. It's, it's okay to get an additional opinion. It's okay to go find a team that would make you feel comfortable like you're being listened to and cared for appropriately. So you got your diagnosis and now what happens? And I understand that some of you have had net for, so we have, I think, I believe some new, newly diagnosed patients and we have some who have been dealing this with some time. Um, but connect with your neuroendocrine physician. As, as Lisa mentioned, try to find someone who has an expertise in net. Discuss your recent diagnosis and symptoms discuss your options and why they may be right or wrong for you. As you could see here, this is just a very brief list. There's multiple medical treatments that may be available to you because of the type of um, tumor you have, hormone therapy, chemotherapy, in some situations, immunotherapy. There might be different surgical treatments that are available to you in the beginning, at some point further down the line. Liver-directed therapy for those patients who may have metastatic tumors to the liver and options for systemic disease. There's radiation therapy, PRT, in addition to all the medical therapies that we have available. So it's important to discuss all these um, and kind of understand at what time point they may be of benefit for you. Ask if your physician participates in a tumor board. What's a tumor board? Well, it's a multidisciplinary team of doctors, just like we have here, meet on a routine basis. So that involves your medical oncologist, your surgeons, your interventional radiologist, your um, radiation oncologists and your interventionalists, we meet and we review all the patient cases and determine what is the next best treatment algorithm. And sometimes we don't come to a complete consensus. We say, you know what, we can go one of two ways and they would both be excellent. And that's where this comes back to the patient and we have a discussion and say, you know, we met at our tumor board. These are the two options. We want to hear what you have to say and what you think would be best for you. And then we, we determine your treatment plan based on that. But it's important, you wanna know if your physician participates in a tumor board. Follow up after you've met all appropriate members of your team. So it's not uncommon that a patient will come see me with the surgical problem and before I do anything, I say, you know what, you have to go see Dr. Hendafar or vice versa. He might, he might send you to one of our interventionalists. So there's a team of people who are working towards giving you the best care and it's important to meet all of those people before you make any type of truly educated decision. Don't be afraid to seek out other opinions, okay? Um, I've said this and I'm gonna keep saying it, and be satisfied and, and trust your team. Well, what if I need surgery? How do I choose the right surgeon? Um, I would say pick someone who's familiar with neuroendocrine tumors. If you're seeing someone who says, you know, I once, I once dealt with this 10 years ago and it's not so common and it's, you know, it's a very, very rare tumor, then maybe get another opinion. Um, consider having all of your care at one institution if you can, where there is a, t a treatment team of neuroendocrine specialists. If that's not possible because of location or anything of that variety insurance, at least see a net specialist at one of those centers and ask them to kind of be the one who oversees your care. Um, we are more than happy to collaborate with physicians who are not necessarily at our institution. We have patients who come all the way from Santa Barbara and Bakersfield and Ventura and all over the place. So um, there's an open line of communication. And at the end of the day, our job as physicians is to make sure that you get the best treatment. So if that means that we can help you get the best treatment elsewhere, that's we're all for it. Um, pick someone who mentions that they do this type of procedure. I have this in quotes because it depends, right? If you come to me and you're talking to me about lung surgery, then 
you need to run away very quickly. I don't do lung surgery, right? So you don't want me operating on your lung, but there's plenty of people here who are more than qualified to do that. Um, so pancreatic surgery, small bowel surgery, things of that variety. So you want to make sure these are people who do what you need to have done. Again, pick someone you feel comfortable with. You're going to be seeing them before surgery. During surgery, you'll be asleep. Um, <laughs> immediately after surgery, and then for a pretty long time thereafter. And it's okay to see more than one surgeon when deciding. Don't worry about our feelings. This is your health, this is your life. It's important to feel comfortable with the team that you're seeing, okay? <coughs> what if I need surgery? So how's my recovery? These are common questions when patients see me. Well, recovery from surgery depends on what part of the body we're operating on, which organs we're operating on, um, the duration of the procedure and the extent of the disease, right? So. Let's say I'm a GI hepatobiliary surgeon, so I'm going to focus on GI and hepatobiliary surgery. Let's say you had a small intestinal tumor, right, and you come in and we do a laparoscopic assisted small bowel resection. We take out a segment of small intestine and we put you back together. Um, well, you can imagine the intestines were not meant to be handled and disturbed, okay, so they go on strike for a period of time, which is what I usually tell my patients. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to have a big incision from stem to stern. It's typically a pretty small incision. There's a little bit of pain associated with it. You may not eat for a day or two after surgery because we want the connection to heal. Um, and then within a week, you're usually home and eating and feeling well and your pain is adequately controlled. What if you have significant liver disease or we're going in to do a metastatectomy, meaning remove multiple different areas of tumor? Well, that's gonna be a little bit more involved, right? So the recovery from that type of surgery might be a little bit longer. What if you're coming in for a resection of a lung nodule? That's typically done laparoscopically, small incision, you're usually home within a day or two. So it's important, I, it's difficult to speak to a crowd and say what should I expect when everyone is dealing with something different, but understand that we should be able to give you realistic expectations of what your recovery would be like. Recovery also depends on your overall health. I mean, there's one question saying, am I a surgical candidate? There's kind of two ways to look at that question. One is, is surgery going to be something that benefits me for the type of disease pattern that I have, right? The second is, am I a candidate because am I healthy, right? So we have some patients who have significant heart disease, not necessarily secondary to their neuroendocrine tumor, sometimes secondary to the neuroendocrine tumor, or bad lungs from, from prior problems, COPD, bad smokers who can't, you know, you can't get up and take 10 steps. Your surgical risk is going to be much higher for a significant operation than if you were operating on me, because right now I'm healthy but who knows what'll happen. So those are important points to keep in mind when you're thinking about recovery and your overall candidacy for surgery. So what happens, let's say you're going to surgery, what happens the day before your procedure? Well, you're usually asked not to drink or eat after midnight. How many people in this room have had a colonoscopy? Those of you who haven't, why not? I'm <laughs> okay. So for those of you who ha have had one, a good job. For those of you who haven't, please, please see someone and get a colonoscopy. <laughs> the new recommendation is to do that by age 45, so that's important, okay? Um, but if you've had one, you probably were given a bowel prep to clean out your intestines, right? So I'm a GI surgeon, so obviously this is near and dear to my heart. You're going to get a bowel prep likely if we're operating on your intestines because we want everything to be cleaned out. That means the day before, although my last point here is get a good night's sleep, you might not get one and that's my fault, so I, I apologize for that in advance. We tell you to take a shower with antibacterial soap. Patients will call and say, well, what kind of soap am I supposed to buy? Believe it or not, 90% of the soaps are antibacterial, so just take a shower is really what this is coming down to. <laughs> Refrain from shaving the area where you will be having surgery. I mention this because patients will call, <laughs> men especially will come in the next morning and they'll say, I, you know, I didn't shave. And I say, that's great, you look good. And they say, no, you told me I couldn't shave. And I say, no, 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 we weren't planning on operating on your face. Don't shave the area that we're operating on. So if we're operating on your chest and your abdomen, don't shave those areas because you have a higher risk of infection. That's what do not shave means. And try get, to get a good night's sleep. So what do you expect after your procedure? Again, it depends on the procedure type. You're going to have some pain. I think paper cuts hurt. No matter how small the cut, it's going to hurt at least a little bit. It varies, again, based on your operation and the procedure type. We will manage your pain. Our goal is to keep your pain down on a scale of 1 to 10 to no higher than a 3. Everybody has a different pain tolerance, um, but 
that's what some people are most afraid of. They say, you can do anything you want as long as I have no pain. And I always say, I can't promise you no pain. We'll try to minimize your pain, but I can't promise you no pain. You're going to be expected to walk the day of or after surgery. Some people say, when can I get out of bed? And I look at them and I say, get out of bed right now. What do you mean when? Go. <laughs> Move. Um, when will you be started on a diet? I say eventually again because I, pr I primarily operate on the GI organs. And so um, you'll be started on a diet eventually. It depends on if things have had to be reconnected or not. It's all about plumbing, right? So um, you'll usually be started on a liquid diet either the day of or a few days after your surgery. If you had lung surgery, then you'll probably get a liquid diet right after. And there's no reason to hold off on that. How long you stay on the hospital is based on your recovery and how you're doing. Is your pain controlled? Are you eating and drinking? What kind of home are you returning to? Do you have help? Do you need help? Do you need to go to rehab? And typically we'll see you one to two weeks after discharge. And then again and again and again. So then what happens after all of this? Well, at this point you then have routine follow-ups with appropriate members of your treatment team, at which point we monitor your progress, monitor your neuroendocrine tumor, um, discuss need for additional treatments, and discuss options for additional treatments. Um, and again, these time points vary based on patients and your tumor type. What should you do between visits? Um, keep a log of questions that you might have. Keep a log of symptoms that you might be experiencing. And if something doesn't feel right and you're not due to see us for a week or two or a month, call us. We want to hear from you. It's important, okay? That, that line of communication needs to be open. You know yourselves better than we do. And the bottom line, I think, is remember that we're a team. As, uh, as Lisa mentioned, there's numerous resources available for neuroendocrine patients. There's numerous patient conferences, online resources, and group. We don't expect you to go through this alone. Um, participate in your treatment plan. We welcome it. Um, and lastly, thank you for, for involving us. And um, thank you to Giovanna for the, for the legacy that she created by developing LACNETS. So thank you guys for being here. So another person who I find really is helpful to hear from is Dr. Nissen. And I think, um, do you want to go next? Um, so Dr. Nissen is um, our liver, uh, a net expert for sure, and a liver transplant surgeon here. Um, deals with a lot of net, and I've also seen him, even though, you know, I, I myself don't have net, it's my husband, and um, this isn't our medical home. I've been in the clinic, in the office with him, and seen him um, do this uh, shared uh, patient decision making in, in real time, and, um, and I really appreciate this approach, so thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. I do not have any slides. I just thought I would come up here and uh, answer questions, tell you a few things, talk a little bit about the field my expertise, liver and pancreatic surgery. Um, and, you know, it's funny to, to talk about, uh, Dr. Ganji was talking about the, the shared physician-patient relationship is so vital not to all of medicine and obviously particularly to, to this field. But we had so many conversations with Giovanna over the decision-making. And, uh, you know, she went to other centers and talked a lot about other things. And she really epitomized that idea of gathering information for yourself, testing it, vetting it, um, running it by other experts, doing your own research, uh, creating organizations to really get it uh, discussed in an open forum. And, um, and I think it's probably the way of the future across a lot of disease types, not just, not just CNETs, but across colorectal cancer, pancreas cancer, lung cancer, um, <coughs> non-cancer conditions as well. So uh, the, the CNET community really led the way in, in patient advocacy and uh, self-sustaining groups uh, like LACNETs. So there's, a, there's w in the field of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and this is really exciting, a lot of you um, um, hear about this, or some of you may experience it personally, some of you may hear about it, but it's a different animal than, than mid-gut carcinoids and lung carcinoids. And there's a lot of debate about if to do surgery, when to do surgery, what scope of surgery to do on pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And of course, the, the, the conversation, uh, the decision making runs the spectrum of what do you do if you find a really early small tumor? Should you leave it alone or monitor or do other things? And of course, all the way to the other end of the spectrum, what do you do if you have more advanced disease, a pancreatic tumor with other liver tumors or other disease? Is there any benefit to doing surgery in those uh, cases. And those are the problems we tackle as surgeons and we tackle it in our in our multidisciplinary groups. A couple of thoughts on that. So there's growing evidence that small 
neuroendocrine tumors, and really we're talking non-functional neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas, are okay to monitor, are okay to not do radical surgeries. Um, obviously, they need to be followed closely. The, the field has kind of moved away from f radical surgeries done for incidental, non-functional, non-symptomatic tumors, much more uh, acceptance of a watch and wait approach. That's always a little bothersome. A person says, I don't want to I don't want to go through life with this, you know, tumor inside me. And, you know, partly that's our job to reassure you, and partly it's the job of the whole field to continue to report results and make sure that this watch and wait, this, this watchful monitoring approach is safe. So the way we approach it now, small tumors in difficult locations, like the head of the pancreas or the, the center of the pancreas, we typically do not remove or do not recommend treatment for. Um, as the tumor gets more towards the left or the tail of the pancreas, sometimes we push, we would, we would recommend removal simply because the surgery is a little easier and a little safer. That formula can change a bit if the surgery gets riskier or, the, or, the, or other issues with, with the patient. But in general, that's the concept. Uh, the head of the pancreas is the most risky area. The tail of the pancreas is the safest area. So small, any tumor in the head of the pancreas you try to avoid, but if it gets bigger and you need surgery, then you need surgery. As you move to the left towards the tail, sometimes have a little higher um, ex uh, uh, willingness to remove tumors. But there's a couple of things you need to know about, and some of you may know this, but I'm going to go over them anyway. Um, the use of of techniques to preserve pancreas, where you take just the tumor out, where you, you either... We, we sometimes use the word enucleation, or you can use the word local resection, where you do surgeries to just remove the tumor itself from the pancreas. And so we're getting better and better at that. So small tumors in the head of the pancreas, or that central part, or even in other parts of the pancreas, can sometimes be removed safely, taking very, very little pancreas. We sometimes, we have some other tricks we use. We sometimes can do them laparoscopically, robotically. Sometimes they require an old-fashioned incision. But the concept's really important, that you're doing a surgery to remove a, a tumor, a lesion, and preserving essentially all of the healthy organ. And that's a really, really important concept in these tumors because these tend to be low-grade tumors that aren't at high risk for spreading. And so we want to use techniques that save the rest of the pancreas. Our GI colleagues are now excited about this, and they now have some instruments where they can put needles into tumors and inject them with alcohol. Sounds like a bad idea, but it actually can work. Or uh, put a heater probe into tumors and heat them, a so-called ablation. It's called radiofrequency ablation. That can be done endoscopically. So in select cases, small tumors can be treated totally non-surgically with an injection of a chemical like alcohol or with a heat treatment uh, with a little probe. We've done this a few times. Uh, the, the best data for this is for a functional tumor because you immediately know if you, if you got it or not. You know, for example, an insulin producing tumor, um, that's a, that is a real mess because it's producing insulin all the time, your blood sugar is low, and if you do one of these chemical injections and you knock out 99% of the tumor, that's great you now have 99% less insulin production, and that may be adequate to just go on with life. So functional tumors are a great one to use these minimally invasive endoscopic type approaches. And so that's being done across the world, really. And I think some of the, we had a symposium last weekend, some of the, uh, some of the other uh, countries that were at the, represented at the symposium are doing this a little more in the U.S., especially ablation. Maybe it's things are less regulated. I don't know. But um, alcohol and ablation treatments are options for small, especially functional neuroendocrine tumors. And pancreas-preserving approaches are options in certain cases for um, small tumors scattered anywhere in the pancreas. Um, makes sense? Questions? Any thoughts, comments? Yeah? When you refer to a small tumor, what well, that's the debate. What size is okay to monitor? So, yep. So, in general, in general, and I'll qualify this in a second. In general, one centimeter, one centimeter or below is tiny. One to two centimeters is considered small. Greater than two, not so small. So, two and two and up, most people would say that makes us kind of nervous. That probably ought to come out. Two or below. You may be okay monitoring. Certainly, one and below, it's okay to monitor. That's that's, and there's some some uh, conditions we want to be dealing with the well differentiated tumors. 
with uh, obviously non-functional we said earlier. But in general, those are, those are rules for the road. Less than one, you're probably fine. Less than one centimeter, you're probably fine to do nothing. Less than two, nah, think about removing it, but weigh in the factor of how risky is the surgery and how easy is it to monitor, how, how, how many scans do you want to get, and, and how old you are. You know, because there's a difference between monitoring something for 50 years and monitoring it for 15 years. And obviously none of us really know what our journey looks like. But, you know, if you're 40 and I told you you've got probably 60 years of monitoring ahead of you, well, I mean, that's a lot of scans. And sometimes that may be the thing where you'd say, I, I, maybe if you can do it safely, I'd, I'd get rid of this thing. If you're 80, well, the surgery is a little harder when you're 80 on, on the patient a little harder when you're 80, and also, in all candor, you've got fewer years of monitoring ahead of you. So we would tend to monitor a one and a half centimeter tumor in an 80 year old because, you know, they're older. It's, if it grows, it'll grow slowly probably, and the surgery is harder on them. I would tend to take out a one and a half centimeter tumor on a 40 year old. That's a lot of years to be monitoring and each time to be kind of nervous, what's my scan going to show and I hope it didn't grow. and you know, I hope there's no lymph nodes involved. So again, one centimeter, one centimeter below, it's okay. One to two, think about it. Weigh in all these factors. Two and greater, uh, you know, I think it's fairly safe. For the most part, we want those out. Yeah. What is the real disadvantage of uh, removing the The real disadvantage is be you're instantly diabetic. And it's a very severe form of diabetic, diabetes. Remember, the pancreas makes enzymes to help us digest food, and it makes insulin to help us control our blood sugar. So if you take out the whole pancreas, it's, we, we use the word brittle diabetes. You have instant, uh, non-reversible, except for transplant, uh, diabetes. So you're insulin dependent from that point on. And in fact, it's a difficult kind of diabetes because the fluctuations in, in blood sugar tend to be pretty severe. Now the technology has come a long way. You can do insulin pumps and iPhone monitoring devices and all these things. So there are cases where we do, we do take out the whole pancreas, but you always want to weigh that pretty carefully. Now because my pancreas was removed completely seven years ago, I cut the pump. And my endocrinologist said it came only once a year because everything is perfect. Perfect, perfect example. It can be done safely. It takes a lot of, takes a committed patient and a good team and a lot of attention to detail, but we've come a long way. And I don't think we're that far away. I mean, the pancreas isn't that smart of an organ. It's really not. So as we get better technology and better sensors, you know, it's not going to be that hard to, to just, you know, have a subcutaneous pump and just monitor this all from, you know, from your doctor's office remotely. So there was another question, yeah. In removing a small tumor from the tail of the pancreas, what are the pros and cons of preserving the spleen, or does the spleen have to be removed? So the spleen... The spleen has some immune function. We know that if you've had a splenectomy, whether it's because of trauma or other things, you are at slightly higher risk for an infection. And the infection, the category of infection is kind of scary. It's called overwhelming post-splenectomy sepsis. So it sounds bad. Uh, the good news is it's really rare. Uh, if you have vaccines to prevent those certain bacteria, um, you can lower your risk of that infection. Things like meningitis and pneumococcus pneumonia, these things, uh, the spleen really helps prevent. Again, good news is they're rare um, and you can be vaccinated against them, but there is a little bit of benefit from having a spleen to fight those infections. So why save the spleen? Number one, maybe some immune benefit for rare infections. And number two, you don't have to do quite as much work to remove it. You don't have to irritate the stomach as much. Um, you don't have to make as big of an incision. So in general, is it okay to leave the spleen? It usually is unless you're trying to get, unless in two circumstances. Number one, you can't do it because after you've divided that piece of the pancreas, the spleen is not viable anymore. And you can usually tell just by looking at it, it turns black. If the spleen turns black, or it's the word we use is infarcted, well, that's not going to end well. So that you usually take that spleen out right at the time. So in other words, the decision's made for you. You do the pancreas surgery. The blood vessels have to be divided for that surgery. You look at the spleen. You said, well, you're either good or you're bad. If it's bad, it's got to come out. So that's one circumstance where you remove it. The other time you remove the spleen is if you're trying to get wider margins around the tumor. 
let's say you've got a four centimeter tumor in the tail of the pancreas and you really want to clean up all the lymph nodes, you want to have a high lymph node yield, you take the spleen out as well to, to really get that, uh, that area cleaned up. My own feeling, in the, in the era of gallium PET scans, which are very, very good at picking up lymph node metastases, I think we can rely more and more on a gallium PET scan to tell us whether you have lymph node metastases. So I don't, for small tumors, I don't think you need to do a splenectomy just to get more lymph nodes. So generally we're doing splenectomies, one, if we know there are lymph nodes involved, because again, we want a wider clearance, or two, if we have to. If the way we took the pancreas out obligates us to do the splenectomy because the spleen isn't viable anymore. Those are the two circumstances we take it out. Are there, are there problems with leaving it in? Yeah, if you leave it in, and it's partly infarcted. You can have a lot of pain afterwards. You, you've got a functional spleen, but you can still have pain and some other trouble. Um, so that's, that's the flip side of leaving it in. So the decision is usually made on the table, except in cases where it's a bigger tumor. Then you'll often plan ahead of time, we're going we're gonna to take the whole thing out. Sort of a roundabout answer, but hopefully that covered most of the things. Oh, sorry, yeah. If you're doing the uh, watchful monitoring, is there still a need for cementostatin antibodies? Great question. Uh, or, or, to, or to put it slightly differently, can we, affect, can we use them to, to keep something from growing? Because that's the current debate, right? I, I've, got a, I've got a tumor. I don't really want to have surgery. Um, maybe I can take advantage of this drug that we all are familiar with to slow it down. I don't think we have any data on that. We've used it selectively and nervously because we're sort of inventing a new use for that drug. That's not what the data, that's not what it was ever used for. So I can't, I guess this is being streamed. Uh, I can't advocate that on, on, on the internet. But uh, might you do that selectively? Yeah, you know, we, 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 we have considered that in cases to use somatostatin analogs to try to suppress tumor growth in some cases, high risk patient person who absolutely can't have surgery, maybe a person who had an early recurrence of a pancreas tumor after an old one was taken out and you don't want to rush back in there again. So it, it could be used in that case. Do we know that it works? No. Is it wrong to use it? Well, that's a question partly for the oncologist and partly for your insurance provider because they're the ones paying for it. So. Well, what we would normally do is wait and see if it grew. Uh, so let's say it's uh, eight millimeters, and we all agree we're going to watch it. Now you come back and it's 11 millimeters, and you say, ah, shoot. Well, we might start it then because the alternative is surgery. It grew, so now you're on the radar for having it removed. So it's either stop it from growing or take it out. Th that's how we would do it. The problem with using it in a tumor that's not growing is a fair number of these don't grow. And now you're on that therapy for years, not really knowing if it's beneficial. So our approach generally... Again, this is a little bit off-label use, but we wouldn't start it unless we saw growth. Because otherwise, you just you don't know if you're doing the right thing, and the months go by, and the months go by. So, so would we use it? Yes, in someone who we didn't really think was a good candidate for surgery, or we were really trying to avoid surgery. Yes, sir? What, what about metastases? I mean, how does that figure into? Metastases? What a single tumor yeah, so the, that's the whole concern. The whole concern is that you lose your window. Your whole, the whole concern is that while you're watching, a tumor is going to spread or metastasize right under your nose. Makes everybody very nervous that, that I'm watching you and next time you come back with the scan and I say, well, this is awkward, but I now see a spot in your liver. And so that's why historically we've been nervous about doing that. We find a tumor. The job is to eradicate the tumor. But we do have more and more evidence on this. And we know partly from surgical data, taking out these tumors, how often are, have they spread to the lymph nodes? And it's slightly different than saying how often will they spread to the lymph nodes. But we have a little bit of data. We know that size uh, matters, that lymphovascular invasion matters, that, that uh, KI-67 matters. So the smaller the better, the well differentiated, the low KI-67, those all make it unlikely to have lymph node metastases. And, and we believe, and I think most centers feel, that unlikely to develop metastases with the condition that once you get, once you see growth, or once you get into that two centimeter range, you're, you're, makes you nervous. It makes you nervous, because we don't have good long-term follow-up 
on, on intermediate sized tumors. We don't. So again, it, so a little bit of this is, is individualizing the treatment. You've got, you've got someone who's a good fit patient, easy surgery, a lot of life years ahead of them. Uh, you might take out a one centimeter tumor because you just don't want to be nervous about that for the next 50 years. You've got an 80 year old um, who's not quite so fit, same tumor, yeah, it might spread, but you know we know we probably can control it with somatostatin analog therapy, even even so. And again, the the the, the whole equation is a little different, so it, it does factor in. But metastases is the whole key. That's the whole conversation we're having. Absolutely, that's the whole concern everybody has about uh, about watching. So you try to balance the risk of surgery against the risk of of metastases. So what is the risk of surgery? Well, for distal pancreatectomies, it's it's very low. It's not zero. It's not zero. You can still have severe complications from distal pancreatectomies, but they're rare. There's a lot of morbidity, though, pancreas loss and other things. So again, we're, we're, we're glad to have this conversation, and, and we want to keep having it. By no means do I, am I trying to imply that surgery shouldn't be done for some of these tumors. We're just being thoughtful about it. Right time, right circumstance, risk of metastases, risk to the patient, number of life years of monitoring, therapies if we're wrong, somatostatin analog therapy. Of course, we've got other therapies right on the horizon now that you may use as a salvage as well. So, I don't want to go over time, Andrew. I think. So, other questions? Yes, sir. If you've been on sandosatin for years and everything's fine and the tumors aren't growing, how do you know the sandosatin is, is working as opposed to nothing? We 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 have this conversation at least once a week. Uh, sometimes somebody was grathered on, grandfathered into sandostatin uh, before we took over. Sometimes we did it because we thought we saw uh, metastatic disease, and now maybe it isn't. So I don't think you can know. The only way to know is to stop it. And Andrew, do you have thoughts on that? What we've we've sometimes talked about a year, just because otherwise it could go on for ten years. In other words, if you if you if you've had rock solid stability for a year and a person says i don't want to take this shot every month of my life for the rest of my life we might pause after a year and just see what happened i don't know of any other way to test that theory except wait and see if it grows and then start it but even then maybe you had the little blip growth and it wasn't going to grow anymore that's just part of that's part of the discussion we have some of this remember is insurance regulated too you can't just give any drug you want to anybody they're, they're expensive drugs too, especially as we talk about shared decision making, because I mean a lot of the times that that specific decision is made by our patients. Yeah. Because we give them all the you know we say that these are the pros, these are the cons. This is what we know. This is what we don't know, and you know what do you think about it? Yeah. All right. I did want to say, I did want to make one brief segue to the liver, because I think the liver is the is the you know, really the frontier right now. There's so many competing therapies. It's like the Wild West. You know, you've got, you've got bland embolization, chemoembolization, radioembolization, surgical resection, surgical ablation. You've even got different kinds of ablation, IRE, RFA, uh, um, uh, you know, um, you name it, and we can do it, alcohol ablation, microwave, um, external beam radiation, um, PRT infusions. You've got almost 10 therapies you can offer um, any given patient. And I don't, I'm not going to try to give you any clean algorithm because there is no clean algorithm. My view on it is it's a really, really exciting time uh, to, to, we have all these tools, all these tools, and our challenge is now to figure out the right order, the right sequence, and even whether to use them at all. And, uh, you know, now that PRT is here and we have better systemic therapy, there's no question that there's fewer surgeries being performed. That's okay. I, I'm not, it's not about, it's not about having a job. It's about figuring out the right treatment to keep the tumors in check, to keep the person going strong, to, 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 to win the war. And um, we have so many, uh, I don't want to use the word competing modalities. We should probably say complementary modalities now. Part of the challenge is what order, what, what, uh, what strategy should you use? And PRRT, of course, is the most recent one that kind of gladly, you know, gratefully threw a wrench into everything. Do you do PRRT first and then radioembolization later? We're, we're, we're looking at our own results to see if that's safe to do. And there's so many different um, modalities now. It, it is important to educate yourself. 
our job, of course, is to help sort and filter and understand all those things. But I, I, don't, I think it's pretty clear to say that the general trend has been towards less invasive, less um, radical uh, extirpations and things. And because we've got so many other hepatic arterial and external type of modalities. And that's probably going to continue as we get smarter and smarter drugs and better ability to infuse the liver. And I think what we, as a, what we as a group are doing and what the whole community has to do is to really start to be strict about what we know and what we don't know. And we sometimes, as in our conferences, you know, we'll say, oh, that ought to come out. That, that ought to come out. And then when you really challenge yourself and you say, well, what's the data on that? And what would be the alternative therapy? And by the way, what's wrong with just watching that for a while and seeing if that's really growing? Maybe we'll try a somatostatin analog therapy for a while. And we're asking that question every week with every case, every patient. And it's, it, it's, it's a little confusing because, again, there's so many new players at the table in terms of these modalities. But it's really important that we just keep asking ourselves, um, where have we come over this maybe 15-year journey of hepatic interventions? And, and, and you know, wh what's the future look like in terms of competing or complementary therapies? And I think it's going to keep changing. Uh, I certainly think there are there are roles for these cytoreductive therapies, as we call them. Um, but as PRRT gets smarter and better, and as the infusional therapies get smarter and better, you know, most people would would lean towards that, and we as a center do as well. So, anyway, it's an exciting time. Yes, please. Uh, about the PRRT, uh, uh, I understand that it's a good uh, information about the, the reducing the tumor with uh, this technique, the PRRT. However, it's only uh, accepted when, when the, the metastasis or the tumor is not growing. It's uh, growing, I'm sorry. If it's a stable, it's not, uh, the treatment is not uh, covered by the insurance, it's not accepted. To me, it's, uh, it's not logic, because actually, if it's stable, you can use this, and perhaps you can shrink it. What could be the reason? Or, or not well, the, I mean, the, first of all, the data comes from tumors that had progressed. So we've got to be careful. We're, you know, the study shows improved benefit when you had tumors that were progressing. Okay, so we know. Secondly, it's not a totally benign therapy. Bone marrow problems and other problems. So you've got to be a little careful about taking a, uh, a person that's got really, really stable tumors and giving them something that could hurt their kidneys or their bone marrow. You know, that may seem like a smart thing now in 2020 because you may decrease the tumor by 20 or 30 percent. But, you know, what happens in 2026 when we get a smarter PRRT, something that is even better and more focused? Oh, but the one time you can't use it is if you've had prior PRRT. And you say to yourself, why did I do that back in 2020? Why did I expose my kidneys, my bone marrow to that drug when I was perfectly stable? And so it's, it's not, it's a great therapy. We all know that. But it's not completely benign. It does have consequences of future radiation dosing. That gets factored in all the time. And if you're an insurance adjuster, you're going to say, I have no data. I, I, it sounds like a great idea, but I'm not going to pay for it. Because I've got data saying that it's helpful if you're progressing. What do we think as a center? Well, we're cautious about it. We're very, very excited. And I think the right question to ask is, when do you use it? When is it optimal to use it? Maybe it is optimal to use it before any other treatment. Maybe that's the future. Maybe the future is, as soon as you make the diagnosis of metastatic disease, you do it. And only if you progress do you go on somatostatin analog therapy. I mean, there's a whole bunch of possible future paradigms. And it's, it's tough to set up those studies because somebody's got to fund them. But um, they're important questions to ask. And so right now we have restrictions of insurance companies. And we have restrictions of nervousness about stacking future radiation therapies. Because, again, once you've done it, you get nervous about doing, a lot of you know this, you know, you do four treatments and you get nervous about the fifth and the sixth and what about the future. And that, that I think we, we still have to figure out how much you can do and how much you can give. But... Are there any known uh, triggers that will cause this cancer metastasis? Triggers to cause metastases. I, I don't, not that I know of. I mean, we know, we know correlates to metastasis. We know growth rate. We know size. We know differentiation pattern. But those aren't quite the same as triggers. 
So I, I would say more warning signs would be, so warning signs would be growth, would be a, a, a higher grade tumor on biopsy. Um, would, I think in general symptoms, symptoms are always something we pay a lot of attention to, whether it's pancreatic or midgut, we always take functional t or symptomatic tumors more seriously. Um, other signs of, of progressing of, of, of metastases about, again, poor, a poor differentiation pattern, uh, even pets, you know, we worry. Gallium pets are great, right? These are great. There's, sometimes we get too much information. Spots all over, and we don't know what that means. Um, but we look at the at the gallium scan as a little bit of a biomarker. A, 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 a gallium scan that looks just like it's supposed to is probably a better behaved tumor. A gallium scan that doesn't look like it's supposed to, meaning a, a less differentiated, more worrisome. So that's even a, a, a thing we're using. I'm not, I don't want to put that in writing yet, but we all, we all sort of think that, that if it's gallium pet not very um, active, that's a concerning sign and, and maybe a warning sign for earlier metastases. We might even be more aggressive with that tumor because we say that's not acting like our, our well-differentiated, slow-growing tumor. So. Um, yeah. Another common question that comes up is, is the if a patient has tumors in their liver that might be considered inoperable, is there a place to remove? Is there a place for removing the primary tumor? Yeah, there's a lot of data on this um, that there is benefit to that. Um, we're talking primarily midgut tumors here. Yeah, so peanuts, we we uh, peanuts are tricky because if we just think about the pancreas, head or tail, just of course well, there's a middle too, but think about the head or the tail. Um, remember that for Removing the head of the pancreas for neuroendocrine tumors, that sometimes requires the Whipple procedure. The Whipple procedure comes with it rebuilding the bile ducts. You have to reconnect the, the, the structures of the liver to the intestine. That greatly increases the risk of future liver therapies. So it's not benign to do a Whipple in someone with liver metastases. Their, their future treatment options shrink dramatically. So we really got to take that into account. In the tail of the pancreas, doesn't affect your, your, your ability to treat liver tumors. So if you had symptoms, if you had a large tumor, if you had bleeding, if you had other things, we absolutely would. What about the two centimeter uh, spot in the tail of the pancreas with a whole bunch of tumors? I, I don't, Alex, do you know? I don't know of good data on that, that that's beneficial. I really don't. You'd have to really think hard about that because it's not without significance. Any, any? No, I don't think there's any data for pancreas. There's some limited retrospective data for small bowel. Yeah. Um, so, so for small, small bowel, bowel, you know, mid-gut tumors where the liver, where you have metastatic disease and a primary tumor, many centers will still remove the primary uh, because of concern over progression of ischemia, progression of bowel obstruction, progression of local desmoplastic, and theoretically progression of metastases. But it's primarily to make sure you don't have local tumor progression. Do we do that? We do it, I don't want to say 100% of the time, but selectively, you do more of these than I do, Alex. Um, but I, I think pretty aggressively, but there are certainly cases you don't because it just doesn't make sense. But I, if you said in general, should I have the tumor, a primary tumor removed even though I have metastatic disease? Mid-gut, yes. Pancreas, awesome. not so sure. Um, and our third speaker, um, who's been waiting and has been so excellently supportive of uh, LACNETS for um, at least the last seven years <laughs> um, and heads up the neuroendocrine tumor program here is Dr. Andrew Hennifar. So I was going to give you the same talk that I give to other um, cancer doctors when talking about how to treat neuroendocrine tumors. And when you're a part of a team, there's always a moment in time where you're the quarterback, right? No matter what position you have on a team, it, there's always your time to shine when everybody looks to you for an answer or to complete a specific task. And sometimes as a medical oncologist, I'll, I'll feel like the quarterback. And I'm sure sometimes as a patient, you'll feel that way too. You'll come in and everyone, the whole treatment team will be looking to you to make a decision. Uh, you'll be the one with the, who, ha who holds the information that we need to move forward. And then there'll be other days where you're... <laughs> And for me, more days than most is the water boy. What kind of water would you like, right? Filtered, flat, sparkling, right? So you're more playing a supportive role. You're just there to kind of help out 
you're there to provide something that's needed and, and that's what a team means right a team means that a bunch of you know that the the whole is better than any one single person and that in any specific time or place one person is going to be preeminent and make more decisions than another and that's okay that's how it's supposed to be now what's really interesting about neuroendocrine tumors unlike most diseases is that you have a very big team very big team um, and that's, that is unusual. Most cancers, you won't touch so many different providers. So that, in a way, that's good, and in a way, that makes it more challenging, right? Because you have a big team. And you see here, here's a patient, very important part, medical oncology, and this is not in any order of importance, so I apologize, Dr. Ganji. Medical oncology, surgical oncology, endocrinology, radiology, hepatobiliary surgery, nuclear medicine, interventional radiology, gastroenterology, dietitian, genetic counselor, palliative care. Did I leave anything out? You could probably put in massage therapist. Massage therapist. <laughs> that should be the biggest box. Nurses, that's a great point, of course. I should get shot right now. <laughs> of course. They could put that under the social work. Insurance coordinator. Insurance coordinator. That is so true, right? And and every one of the team members, it's interesting when you say that, because every single one of these team members will have their day when everybody looks to them as the quarterback, right? So how as a patient or how as a provider do you navigate such a big team? You know, how does that work? Well, this is, this is why at our institute what we really like to do is bring everyone together at the tumor board, because that's a way when everybody can kind of touch base. It's kind of like the team huddle. Maybe, maybe many of you participate in team huddles in your own work. And so that's kind of like our team huddle. We also have different team huddles within each group too. That can also be a time when all your team members will intersect with each other and have a conversation. So what, is, what are the different types of interactions between uh, patients and their providers? Um, and what does it mean to have shared decision making? It kind of seems in one way kind of obvious, and maybe, but maybe not so obvious. But I, I would say that in, in general, though historically, uh, medicine has been pr practiced in a paternalistic way in that, you know, you would see a physician or provider or a healer, and they would say, you know, this is what you need to get better. And more recently, and the way I was trained, was that you are more of an informed medical decision. You, you provide information and allow patients to make decisions. So when I was in training, it was very important that we didn't make decisions for our patients, but we just presented to them the information, and then we said, okay, now you can make a decision. And that's how I was trained. And that, that also has probably a lot of positive and negative attributes. Can anyone think of some good and bad about those two approaches? Anything comes to mind? Yes. Well, in regards to our disease, um, it's hard to give the information to the patient if, once the, if they're somewhat new, in a sense, to the disease, and they're learning at a slower rate than maybe you're giving them the information the disease is progressing. Right. Plus, then, if they do have the information that you can to them to like, go home, think about this is what we're going to do, who do they bounce that off of at home because they have a very complicated type of cancer? Right. So even though you, you know, their family or, or whoever caregiver is somewhat informed, it's still every general idea of cancer is the opposite of our cancer. Right. In a sense. So right, right. they so, are, so a great point. like this would be where I would come to make that kind of informed decision. Excellent point. So, so maybe, maybe there's too much information to make good decision making, and maybe you need to bounce it off other people, other ideas. Um, yeah, and I think shared decision making is where ideally we would end up in neuroendocrine tumors and really in almost any disease, in that there's a good flow of communication, and you know, what the right answer is not the same for every person. So if two people have the same exact issues, the right treatment for each of those people aren't, aren't necessarily gonna be the same which in a way is kind of crazy, right? Because you would think that this is medicine, it's a science, and that if you have A plus B plus C, this is the answer that you get. But because in this disease specifically, there are lots of caveats, there are lots of unique issues, meaning a lot of patients will have this disease for decades. A lot of the therapies haven't been tested against each other. So values and preferences become super important. 
So you're going to have to express your value and your preference to your provider. And that, can now, and that would be very helpful to make the right decision for you. Sometimes it's hard because you might not know the first day what your values are. You might not have thought about it, right? Um, okay, so what are the patients? So, you know, when you think about what are needs, what are values, there are people who have really thought about this a lot um, and have put together, I don't know if in, in, in college I remember the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and I remember self-actualization was on the top, and I don't know what that means still today. <laughs> so I don't, know how, I don't know how useful this is for you. But it's interesting that just, you know, someone else is telling you what's important to you. I love that, but you know, we can, you can use it as kind of a, something to think about, right? So whether it be physiologic um, needs, that's at the bottom. Okay, maybe. So consciousness, nutrition, pain relief. I don't know, pain relief is pretty important, so that's pretty low for to me. But safety, of course, this is very important, right? Safety of yourself and probably of your family and your loved ones, that, you know, support is, of course, very important. You know, and these are, these are important things to think about. You might not think about the first time, but if you have a lot of support versus you don't have a lot of support, that will, might affect what kind of decisions you might make. You know, you might, if you are, you know, somebody who is older but very independent, but you live on your own, um, you know, and you need to go to, you might do a Whipple and you might not, you really have to take into account, well, who's going to help me recover from that Whipple? So this is something that really needs to be talked about. Uh, personal development, you know, you know, knowledge, skills, values, self-esteem. Um, I don't know what that, you know. Sure. Then <laughs> empowerment. Empowerment is, of course, important because, you know, we want you to, you want to make the decision something that you believe in and that it also comes from you. We don't want it to be a decision where um, it's actually told to you what you have to do. We want you to feel empowered because that's important. And time. I guess time is up there. I'm not sure. Maybe this is a reverse pyramid or something like that. <laughs> okay, another interesting thing and, and thing that's very important is... Where, and where preferences come in a lot in this disease is that we don't have, so you know most recipes, sequence of events is very important. So when you're making you know, a cake or a pie, you gotta do things in the right order. For neuroendocrine tumors, we don't know if that's true. We really don't. We don't know if it matters if you do surgery or the shots or your PRT, we don't know what the order, if it matters. We even talked about it today, why not first PRT? You know, that's a great idea, but we don't know. We just don't know. And honestly, if you end up in Europe, you would get PRT first, okay? And then this is just the way it is. And, but they haven't answered the question either, why first? Um, so this is a really important, and this, when, and this is why your role in the care team is so important, because a lot of times your preferences and values will dictate what order you do something in, because we don't know. And if you don't know, then that's when you have to base it on other pieces of information. Right, sequencing might or might. And this is what I tell other cancer doctors, too. Because they always ask me, well, what do we do first? What do we do second? What do we do third? And it's interesting to me that a lot of people have very strong ideas and beliefs. But, you know, until we have the science, there will be a clinical trial in pancreas uh, neuroendocrine tumors soon, looking at PRT versus CAPTEM, which are chemo pills. I might be makes no sense to some of you. But, so that's a sequencing trial, which we're actually all of us are very excited about because we're gonna answer at least one sequencing question in one disease. And then a lot, uh, what's even more difficult is that although we all have neuroendocrine tumors, they're not all the same because they're also not from the same organ. And these sequencing questions might have different answers. The recipe might be different depending on whether you have a lung, a pancreas, or a midgut, or hindgut tumor. Yeah, it could be. What about the metastases? Are the same type of tests, but same spine? Right. So that's a good point. Right. So we generally treat tumors um, based on where they start from, as far as sequence. But you're right. Sometimes different tumors will have the same metastatic presentation. Right. You could have a pancreas or a midgut with just liver mets. And you're right, in some ways the treatments would be very similar, but in some ways they would be different. 
So it does add complexity to this. And why you can't really match notes, right? So if two patients have the same disease, you're on Facebook, you know, I don't know if there's a Facebook account, and you're looking through and they're like, well, this one got this, and then this one got this, and why is it not the same? Why is it different? Why are the sequencing different? These are the reasons why. These are the reasons why. And don't forget values and preferences of the patient. So I like to draw these. Um, I didn't draw them. I mean, I like to. This, this is kind of sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Yes. OK. Sometimes um, this is what it's kind of like. So if you have a carcinoid syndrome and you have a midgut tumor, your treatment team is going to be a little bit different than if you have a pancreas tumor that got resurgery, okay? So let's just take your, your, your team for midgut. And a lot of times, the bubble sizes are going to change. You're going to be more, one of the team members might be more important than another in a certain disease state or a certain time of disease. So this is like a nice way to, to graphically present how your treatment team changes over time and how different members come in, different members leave, and different members have more importance. Here, a patient might have a lot more you know, importance about what kind of preferences they have, um, about how to approach it. You might have three or four different perfectly good options to treat a certain problem, and you as the patient will have to say, well, these are my preferences, these are my values, this is what I, what I would like. And there'll be other situations where you know, the surgeon it's just going to be like, this is what we're going to do. And you, you know, they're like, well, there's, no, there's option, it's just surgery. There's not a lot of other options. And everybody in your treatment team might be saying, yeah, I mean, that's, that's your, you know, this is the kind of thing that you need to remove. And there are not a lot of other options. So then your treatment team might shrink down a little bit. And the importances of each member might change. I don't know if that makes sense. Does it? OK. Now, if you have a poorly differentiated or high-grade neuroendocrine tumor, most of your treatments are just you know, systemic treatments, meaning we give it through your circulation, like medicines. And there are different types of medicines that may or may not be helpful or more helpful. Now, if you have, if you have mid-gut tumors, we do a lot of somatostatin analog therapy. There are pills that you can take called Everolimus. We have radionuclide antibody therapy, or peptide receptor radiotherapy. And for those who don't know, peptide receptor radiotherapy, conceptually, we call it systemic radiation therapy. So instead of you know, giving energy through a beam, like they do with radiation therapy, we connect that energy, which is in the form of lutetium, a radioactive particle. It's combined to an antibody. That antibody medicine conjugate is actually injected into your vein, and the radiation is bound to the tumor, and then the rest of it is excreted. And that's what peptide receptor radiotherapy is. It's very interesting medicine. And actually, it's going to change the way cancer therapy is given. Because right now, in development, are a whole bunch of different types of antibodies and uh, different types of energies that are being developed for all kinds of cancer. So it's really going to change the way cancer therapy is given. So you guys are pioneers in the neuroendocrine tumor world. Another option is cytoreductive surgery. Um, that's often done. And definitive surgery. Surgery is, is a very widely used, commonly used treatment for mid-gut tumors. And finally, there's liver-directed therapy. Now, if you notice, this list of treatments is much different than the list I just told you, even though they're both neuroendocrine tumors. Now, if you have a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, um, the treatment options are pretty similar to that of a mid-gut tumor. They're pretty similar, except you do have more systemic therapy options. Anyone have any questions about these things? No? OK, good. And then hindgut tumors. Again, you have a menu of options, a little bit different than pancreas, a little bit more similar to midgut. OK, and finally, one thing that, that's often uh, something that's asked a lot is who should get peptide receptor radiotherapy? Does everyone, anyone have any questions about that, what it is before we talk about who should have it? Okay, we all got it, good. So one thing is that your tumor has to have this somatostatin receptor, and the way we check that is that we do the gallium 68, and we used to do a Noctria scan, so a Noctria scan could work, but it's kind of an older test. 
Um, so that's first thing. Two, it has to be the right therapy for you. Um, and that, you know, talk to the, your doctor about that. What are the usually, I mean, it's approved for GEP nets, which are any neuroendocrine tumor in the abdominal area. And it's approved for patients who have progressed on somatostatin analog therapy. But I'll be very honest with you, even though the cameras are rolling, I'm okay with that, that there are a lot of other times that we have given this medication and different indications. So you should, if it's something that may or may not be relevant to you, you should speak to your doctor about it. We always consider functional status, meaning whether or not you are symptomatic from your tumor, because patients who are symptomatic are usually better candidates for PRT, generally speaking, as a general idea. So if you have, for example, carcinoid syndrome that's not well controlled on standard medications, we are more likely to do something like PRT, for example. And then the other thing is to, if many patients have received PRT already, and they've received it either when it was first approved or on clinical trial, or they went to Europe and actually had it, you know, when it was approved there and not here. So a lot of times we're talking about who's a good candidate for retreatment. And that's something uh, that we do have certain guidelines and certain ideas about, but again, something you should talk to with your uh, own provider about whether or not you'd be a good candidate for retreatment. All right, so I think I've covered a lot of <laughs> ground. If you have any questions or anything you want to discuss, please let me know. Thanks for your attention. Um, um, when you were talking just about the retreatment, so just to, you know, asking, um, turn and kind of what would, what, what would one of those indicators be to qualify you for retreatment? Uh, I think, I think it's, it's, it's a great, it's a great, a great question. question. A lot of the times the criteria has to do with how much benefit you received the first time around. And that's usually described in, amount, in terms of time. What do you mean time? For how long? Uh, right. But that might not be the only, only criteria to take into account for you as an individual patient. There might be other mitigating circumstances where there is benefit to maybe pain, to functional syndrome. There could be other reasons to give it if you don't quite meet the length of time criteria. And even how much time hasn't been firmly established. So these are like, these are tough questions that you really need to talk to your provider about. What if the actual drug changes? Like, so you had PRRT and then the drug, and they got a different drug with their... Yeah, that's a great question, right. So that, that would be on a clinical trial right now, and, and then each clinical trial will have guidelines on who qualifies, and there would be a stipulation in that study if you received P, you know, Lutathera, for example, what would be the expected outcome for you to um, be eligible? They want, sometimes they want people who only did well, and they might want people who didn't do well. It might be a study specifically for patients who it didn't work for. So it's going to be very study specific. But that's a great question. And, and why so few clinical trials for people with lung cancer? <laughs> well, that's changing. <laughs> that's changing. So there will be a PRT lung neuroendocrine tumor study. It's going to be, um, I, I, yeah, by from, it's, it's going to be great. It's comparing Everolimus versus PRT, and if you get Everolimus, you'll be randomized to PRT, and then the, so you'll uh, cross over. PRT will be provided by, for free by AAA, so it won't be an insurance issue at all. Um, and it's a great, it's a great study. Right, right. I, I think if you have it only in the lung, they'd be like, well, why not surgery? Why not surgery? But it could be a situation where there, there are lots of like unique circumstances. So one of the challenges, um, I also sit on the NCI clinical, um, the NCI chair steering committee where we approve some of these trials. And some of the challenges we have in lung nets is that we've opened some and they don't accrue enough. And we have trials that close without getting enough patients in them. And so lung nets, because of the different population, even the PRT trial, right, it's only going to be open for those who are GOTA positive or GOTA avid, the uh, ability to recruit for these trials is really challenging. And so we kind of close some that just, I'm um, thinking of spin net, um, which is the <coughs> side uh, right. for 
and this is a challenge. So when you see these trials, all of you who've been in a clinical trial, um, just give yourself a hand, because that's what we really need to keep clinical trials running and open, and for us to um, really get them out in the community. So uh, when we put all this machinery together and then don't accrue, it's a real challenge. Yeah, and I have to say, I think it's mostly the provider's fault, not the patient's fault for that issue, but yeah. It's, 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 it's a great point. So, but lung, yeah, yeah, that's the thing. But I think the lung, the lung study is, is such a good, perfectly timed study that I'm very, I'm very optimistic about it. I'm very optimistic. SpinNet was complicated because, yeah. Yeah, SpinNet was a tough one, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's a good point. We gotta get on, we gotta get on, we gotta, we gotta do it. <laughs> good point. We're gonna make it happen. Yes. Dr. Hindekar, uh, just to address this young lady's question over here, there is a database that we as patients can access. Um, Lisa, do you have a link for that? I, I looked at it, I just kind of crossed my mind. It gets confusing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, clinicaltrials.gov is tough. I use it sometimes. It's even tough for me because it, it'll, it'll, it'll pull up every single study, whether it's open or closed, regardless of, and then you, you'll, you can start playing with subheadings and, and whittle it down, but it's still like, if there's a study in, in Norway that is open for lung nets, it'll pop up, right, as a top hit, and you're like, well, that's, right, so it's, it's tough. <laughs> So I think the best thing to do is, is maybe um, circle. Does LACNETs have a way to help patients find studies or no? The, um, if you're on smart patients, they have a kind of a, a um, there's a couple of backdoor APIs to clinicaltrials.gov. And smart patients actually has a clinical trial navigator that uses AI and a little bit more friendly than um, clinicaltrials.gov, although <laughs> please give recommendations on how to improve it. We're always trying to improve clinical files.gov and they're open. It gets better all the time. But you can put in what you're doing and it will show you the drugs that are involved and how close they are. And they'll only show you phase two or phase three that are recruiting. So it gets much easier to see. Um, that sounds like a great resource. Yeah. How, how do they get to that? Smart patients, um, I, it's a, it's a, um, kind of uh, forum for patients to... Beautiful. To so smartpatients.org. Smart um, dot org or dot dot org. Number, but it has a very good one. That sounds great. But there's also the issue of a patient bringing a clinical trial that they saw to you and you have reasons that you don't think they're right for the trial. Right. I mean, that's, that's true. But, you know, studies that are vetted through cooperative groups, those are bulletproof. Those have been already talked about amongst... The experts in the U.S. and there, there's rarely a time when there's a cooperative group or SWOG or ECOG. There are these acronyms that refer to groups of expert medical centers who work together to study these things. There'll be a rare time when those aren't a good study. But you're right. There, there are times when you have a study and your provider might not think it's the best study for you. And cancer.gov has a service that you can call up. Um, I'll give the link as well and tell them your circumstances and they will do the research for you and send you a um, vetted version of things that are went through the NIH um, or the NCI and that uh, and are through the cooperative group. So they'll do a lot of that like work for you. Thank you so much. All right, thank you for thanks for your attention. <laughs>